Hi everybody, thanks for joining Soft Magnetics. Hard topics. So it's been a while, but we're gonna go over some of the stuff that we've been hearing at trade shows. And the first one is that most ferrite cores are small relative to other magnetic materials. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, that's a question we get a lot of, you know, why you don't see, you have big transformers and such on, on power lines that require cranes to get lifted into place. And most ferrite cores you see are, are tiny by comparison. I mean, tens of grams, 100 grams, something like that. Um, you know, we have some examples here. This is maybe call a, something of a, there we go, something of like a median sized core. Um, and, you know, they get really small into. Itty bitty. Man, the focus hates me. Oh, it worked. I'm an influencer. But yeah, so you won't see huge ferrites, generally speaking, at least ferrites formed as a single piece. Yeah, most of the ferrite cores you're going to see are smaller. When we were talking about pretty large ferrite cores, you might be talking about things this big. Um, maybe things that big. You know, this is probably a kilo or two weight-wise of a core, but you're not going to see stuff too much bigger than that. Again, that was made as a, a single piece. So you can do things like glue multiple cores together to make one larger core, but there's a couple practical reasons why you're not going to see really large ferrite cores. So the way this stuff is produced, it's kind of like a ceramic. Um, so first of all, it has to get pressed. It gets pressed as a dry powder. Um, using a tool. So this is you know, the most basic of ferrite tools. You have a die cavity here. So this is going to form the outside of your part. You have a lower punch that goes into said die cavity. An upper punch. So the cavity is going to get filled. This comes down, compresses the powder together. In the case of this tool, it's forming a toroidal core. So you're going to have a core rod. Um, that's going to be responsible for making the hole in the center of the core. And out comes your core. So from a pressing perspective, what's going to be your limiting factor? You're going to have only so much, you know, this die only has so much length. So we're only going to have so much stroke length for the height of the part that we can make. Now you could have longer dies to an extent, but the press is going to dictate how long of a die you can have and realize that the length of this die isn't the length of the part you can make. It's gonna be about three to four times taller than the part it can produce because it has to compact. And the next thing is gonna be the surface area. So when we're talking about surface area for a pressed part, you're looking at the diameter, since this is a circular one, the diameter of that hole. Um, minus the core rod. So that's going to be our surface area of the part. And that's going to dictate how much tonnage we need to press that part at. So ferrites, generally speaking, get all pressed at roughly the same tonnage. We compact them all with the same tonnage presses or same tonnage of uh, pressure in the die. So that's going to be able to compact it the same. So whether you have a part like this or a part like this, you're going to be using the same um, you know, PSI on that die. Now, the tonnage for this is much, much higher because we have a ton more surface area. So how high tonnage of a press you have is going to dictate how much surface area. The stroke length of that press and die combo is going to dictate uh, your height of the part that you can press. So that's one reason. So without having massive, massive presses with impossibly long stroke lengths. I mean, you'll, you'll wind up with a press that takes up, you know, the size of a building and is as tall as a four story building to press some genuinely large parts. The other portion is going to be in the firing of a part. So once these are all pressed, they have to go through a sintering process, which is anywhere between, you know, well, say north of a thousand C that the parts have to get centered at. Now, ferrite being a ceramic, it 
doesn't really heat and cool so well. So in order to get the heating consistent throughout the part, so the inside, outside, everything, the part has to be heated and cooled very slowly. Um, so slowly, in fact, that when you have a part like this, it may need to be inside of a kiln for well over a week um, in order to get it as consistent as possible throughout the part. So a couple things, right? So if you have a pretty large part, but it's got pretty thin walls, it doesn't require a lot of tonnage to press, and your surface area to volume ratio is pretty good, so it can fire relatively quickly. So if you had a you know, part with walls just as thin as this, but made it, I don't know, a meter in diameter, if we had a furnace that could have a meter diameter part in it, you could center it with relatively little issue. Um, as soon as the parts start getting thicker, the surface area to volume ratio is dropping. Now you have to fire it for considerably longer. And at a point it just really stops being economical to make a part like that. I mean, in theory you could heat and cool it slow enough to make you know, kind of infinitely large ferrites. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that ferrite's going to be very expensive, not to mention hard to handle being a ceramic that large. Um, from a performance standpoint, there's a whole nother, probably a whole nother video, frankly, okay. or series of videos and or paper and a lot of research that needs to still be done on dimensional resonance in ferrites. You know, the, I mean, quick overview, big parts. When you boil it back down to material properties, big parts work worse than little parts um, in terms of the bandwidth they're able to operate over, um, having higher losses at lower bandwidths or lower frequencies for, you know, power rated stuff and not having the same high bandwidth for suppression applications. Um, that'll be present in all materials, especially noticeable in, in manganese zincs. Um, you'll actually see that from not just us, but other manufacturers as well. You'll start, you'll notice certain materials tend to be made only in, uh, smaller sized cores because of that. 73 is a really good example from us. I think it actually says as much in our literature. Um, but yeah, it's like a practical reason why you wouldn't make it or a functional reason aside from just a manufacturing. So we're not trying to be clickbaity, but if they want to know more about dimensional resonance, comment and we'll make a video about that. <laughs> yeah, we'll try. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ramble on for a little bit. Um, so, I mean, if there's any cores that are larger than what they see in our catalog, we do custom sizing. Yeah. Like I mentioned, there's, um, <clears throat> Yeah, there's always the ability to glue multiple segments of a quarter together to make a larger magnetic structure. Um, what you see in our catalog is not necessarily as large a core as that we can produce. Um, we, we make some pretty large stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, if there's something that you don't see, feel free to reach out and ask. Um, we can tell you if it's possible, might be possible. We'll try um, all options. <laughs> we'll definitely try. <laughs> we like trying. <laughs> um, well, that's all I have for you today. But thank you, Mike, for going over that. And if you have any other questions, comment, and we'll go over those in the next videos. Bye. Bye.